Penn State was up 17-3. to That's about the time I'm leaving the Cotton Bowl yesterday. So I go to the airport, and right before I'm going to board a flight, I see the end. And I see a 20 spot on the board for Penn State, and I see 23 on the board for Iowa. I, I don't know how it happened. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, 17-3, to all they got to do is all, they could take knees the rest of the day. Iowa shouldn't be able to catch up and overtake that, but they did. And so, man, I, mm, 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 Iowa. Every now and then you get one of those teams, and it's like there could be a million stars in the sky, but if you looked up from their campus, you would only see one because every one of those stars is aligned. And that's exactly what's happening with Iowa right now. Don't apologize for it. Don't feel bad about it. I saw some folks criticizing Iowa fans for storming the field. Let me give our Iowa folks a little advice. Number one, don't listen to me, because I've clearly been off on Iowa this year. But number two, don't pay any mind to what anyone else thinks about the way that you support your program and the way that you feel about your program. Look at this scene. If you're, if you're listening on podcast, I want you to imagine about 70,000 people clad in yellow and black on a field after a game. That's what it's all about. Don't apologize for it. The only reason people are a little salty about it is because they themselves can't be in that position. So good for Iowa. Celebrate. When's the last time it felt like this? Chris Hassel and company. When's the last time you felt like this? Lifetimes ago. That's the answer. So absolutely celebrate it. Consider how this game started. I felt so good early on about the way Penn State started. And they started terribly. So early in the game, Sean Clifford throws a pick inside their own 10-yard line, sets Iowa up first and goal. So you got to be thinking at that point, here comes more of the same. Classic Iowa. This stuff only happens for Iowa. And they get a field goal. Okay. There was another turnover, uh, I think, in the first quarter for Penn State. Yet with all that, they led 17-3. to If you told me last week going into Saturday, Penn State's going to get themselves a 17-3 to lead at some point in the first half, I would have said, bar the door. That's it. Even if they don't score another point, That'll be good enough. And uh, they almost didn't score another point, and it wasn't good enough. Now, Sean Clifford went down in this game. Uh, it obviously had an impact on the outcome. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I just definitively know that Penn State would have won had Sean Clifford still been in. I do think they would have won by double digits how, had he remained in the game. That's what I think. What I think doesn't matter. I thought Penn State was going to win this game. I thought Iowa State was going to beat Iowa. So I've thought a lot of things about Iowa that have been wrong this year. J.P. Poll out tomorrow, by the way. But the game pretty obviously shifted. I think we can at least all agree with that. Clifford doesn't play defense, though, was the thing that I took away from this. And yesterday, now, relative to Iowa, let's just keep that in mind. Yesterday, I think Iowa did some good things offensively. Petrus was 17 of 31, you know, which is not something that you'd be excited about if you were at Oklahoma or Alabama, but, but Iowa's not known for offense this year. He threw it for 195 but he threw for 11.5 yards per completion. They made some big plays through the air when they needed to, and it was in big moments. I caught that touchdown pass, by the way, uh, to Regani about six minutes left in the fourth quarter. If you could just bottle that moment up, if you could bottle up that Spencer Petrus go-ahead touchdown with about six minutes to go in regulation against Penn State when they took the lead for good, and you could just bottle that up, and you could put it into liquid form, and you could inject that into someone's veins, I don't think anyone would ever die again. I think our average life expectancy would be like 400 years old. It would be Methuselah style. I think we could live forever. That kind of adrenaline, from Gus Johnson in the booth, to obviously the players on the field, to Kinnick Stadium, which went on to single-handedly rip any shot Penn State had of coming back out from their clutches. What an environment. It, what an adrenaline-fueled few minutes that ended that game, and it culminated, of course, with the postgame scene on the field. It could be that you live the rest of your life if you're an Iowa Hawkeye fan and you never experience a moment that emotionally charged again. Just incredible. That's why I always tell you guys, this stuff, this college football stuff, it's about Saturdays and it's about moments. It's not about some postseason game off in some NFL dome a thousand miles away from your campus. It's about Saturdays in the fall, those kinds of moments. You can live 100 years. You may never experience anything like that again. The takeaway moving forward, though, is I've talked to several of our Penn State folks. I was going back and forth some today on Twitter with some Penn State folks who said, well, shame on James Franklin. And I said, why is that, friend? Why is it shame on James Franklin? Well, he didn't have a backup quarterback ready. Well, he did. Uh, maybe you missed it. He beat uh, who do you, yeah, he beat South. Yeah, he beat LSU yesterday. Like 
Shame on James Franklin. He didn't have a backup quarterback ready. Yeah, he did. He, the kid beat LSU yesterday. He plays for Kentucky. That's where the backup quarterback went. And so you're using your third string quarterback. Yeah, but shame on him for not going in the transfer portal and getting a kid because he knew, as should any coach worth his salt, that we could be in this position. We could lose our starter. Yeah, he knew it. That's part one of the equation. Bad things could happen. But your part two is what I want to focus on for a second. Shame on James Franklin for not having a backup quarterback. Well, he did. We've established that. Will Levis transferred. So you're really talking about shame on James Franklin for not having a third string quarterback in the house prepared to go on the road and beat Iowa. And your response to that, to a large degree, has been he should have leveraged the portal. To which my response has been, who are we talking about? Which player? We all saw the portal. We all know it's pretty well publicized which quarterbacks were out there. So who are we talking about? Who could, who could Penn State have gotten? T.J. Finley? Is that who they would have gotten? T.J. Finley, is that the kid that's going to go into Iowa and beat them? Oh, by the way, could you have convinced T.J. Finley to come to campus? Now, I'm, not, I'm not speaking in an informed manner. I'm telling you, I'm just pulling a name out of the hat. The answer is, they have the best quarterback roster they could have. There wasn't an option out there. The transfer portal is not a grocery store. I don't know if people have realized this. You can't just go in and grab whatever you want to. It's more like a Venezuelan grocery store. You walk in and the shelves are largely bare and there's like one brand of toilet paper over here and the government owns it and if you don't like it, tough. That's kind of how it is shopping for quarterbacks in the portal. Every now and then you strike gold. But by and large, it's Let's go in there. I don't really feel great about our prospects, especially if we're not looking for a starter. That's the key, guys. You weren't going in there looking for a kid because Sean Clifford was leaving. You were looking for someone because his backup left. What's the selling point that you're going to use to convince a kid that is starting caliber to come to Penn State? It, it wasn't in the cards, is my point. So your best shot now is to get as healthy as you can because they lost some players yesterday. Get as healthy as you can in this bye week. Penn State can absolutely still accomplish every goal they have set out in front of them. There are no unbeatens in this sport this year. I was talking to someone earlier today about this. Sometimes it takes a while for us to shake the years past. 2019 LSU conditioned you. 2020 Alabama conditioned you. And it conditioned you to think as soon as any other team out there shows even the slightest hint of vulnerability, not even to mention a loss, throw them on the scrap heap. Because we think you have to be so good to win a title that if you dare lose a game, there's no way you're capable of it. This is not 2019. There is not a Joe Burrow-led LSU team out there. There is not a 2020 Bama out there this year. The team that's going to end up winning a title or the teams that are going to be there at the end are the ones that respond the best to tasting their own blood, oftentimes in the form of a loss. All Penn State did yesterday was lose a game. If you had one through 10 on a grease board in their locker room, their goals for 2021, none of them got erased, short of going undefeated, short of beating Iowa. None of them got erased yesterday. And for all you know, they may see them again. Who knows? No one knows how the season's going to play out. It's a challenge right now. They got to buy at the perfect time. They got to get Sean Clifford back. Don't have an update on him right now, but Penn State still has it to do. Iowa, however, they are now undefeated still. They are cruising right along still, but as I have continued to tell you in the odds making community for whatever that's worth to you at this point, they are not going to view this undefeated as they would most undefeateds. And the case in point is this week's spread. Purdue is not a good team. They are coming to Iowa. Iowa opened as like an 11 or 11 and a half point favorite. I mean, that's, that's the way it is right now with Iowa. Doesn't matter. Keep winning games. Doesn't matter.